Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak. Um, it, it's really a privilege to, um, to join you in your country by Zoom um, and talk about prevention of COVID-19 in Tanzania. I, I've never been to Tanzania, but my son has spent some time. He's, he's a, a young doctor. He spent some time in Tanzania. Um, so everything I have got wrong about Tanzania here is, you can blame my son. Um, I just also want to thank uh, Rebecca Inglis, who's made some of the slides for me. Uh, so let's um, get on. Can I just ask, you can now see my second slide. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to persuade you that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is airborne. Uh, we've already written a paper for The Lancet uh, called 10 Reasons in Support of Airborne Transmission. Um, and since that paper was published about a month ago, people have come up with more reasons, 11, 12, 13 reasons. There's many, many streams of evidence which show quite definitively that this virus spreads through the air and almost certainly airborne spread is the predominant route of transmission. Now, I know that not everyone believes that, uh, but there is a lot of scientific evidence for it. And everything I go on to say uh, is going to be about preventing airborne transmission. Um, it is important also to note um, that tuberculosis is also an airborne disease. So all the measures that we're going to talk about are also going to be effective in the prevention of the spread of tuberculosis. Um, I think I'm right in saying that more people are dying of TB in Africa at the moment than are dying of COVID. So let's not forget uh, other infectious diseases. Now, Probably many of you know uh, the basics of prevention already, and I don't want to patronize you. Um, you know the message probably hands, face, space, uh, ventilate. Um, what they were used to say, the WHO were very keen on hand washing initially uh, because they assumed that the virus was spread by droplets. And yes, it is true, we should be washing our hands. Hand washing prevents diarrheal disease. It may help prevent the spread of COVID. Um, but actually, the hand washing needs to be put in perspective because masking, in other words, covering the face, um, physical distancing, sometimes called social distancing of two meters, uh, that's really important both to prevent droplet spread, but also because aerosol transmission occurs mainly within two meters. It also occurs beyond two meters, but if we can keep uh, uh, physically distant from people, uh, that is a really good way of preventing spread. Uh, but most importantly, ventilate. Uh, and this is the new one. This has only been added uh, to the WHO recommendations in the last maybe two or three months. Um, the Japanese, in fact, uh, began very, very early in February 2020 with this three C's slogan, avoid the three C's, avoid crowds, avoid closed, closed spaces and close contact. And that was because uh, Japanese researchers believed from the outset that COVID-19, the virus causing COVID-19 was airborne. So we're moving from a prevention strategy that focused predominantly on hand washing, to one that embraces ventilation and space uh, as really key measures. Uh, and as I put on the top of the slide, the prevention measures need to be very simple. They need to be culturally congruent and available in all the languages spoken uh, locally. Very, very important. Um, so, yeah, so here's another um, Poster. These posters you can download from the CDC website in, um, in Atlanta in America. Uh, many of you will be familiar with them already, but if you simply put CDC into Google um, and then put in the word Swahili, you get lots of interesting uh, posters which you can download and use. Now, because COVID spreads in the air, because the virus spreads in the air, 
indoors is much more dangerous than outdoors and closed spaces are very, very dangerous uh, for the transmission of this disease, especially if you are spending a long time in those closed spaces. So two uh, particular things uh, are, are really, really risky. One is travel uh, in buses or trains or taxis that have the windows closed and have a roof on, and also the working environment. You can see here, um, you know, people are at work, but there's a lot of people in that room. Uh, and yeah, maybe there's a window open, but it's not a very big window compared to the size of the room. So these are highly risky situations. Very sadly, um, communal worship is also high risk. There are many super spreader events that have happened in church. This virus is not a respecter of the sacred space. Um, singing and chanting, anything that involves vocalization uh, is a big problem because it produces aerosols. It doesn't produce many droplets, but it produces aerosolized virus. Uh, and so uh, in, my, um, in my country, in a church now, you, you don't sing anymore. And it's, it's really sad. Uh, my mother died of COVID and we had a funeral with no singing uh, because singing is a, is a really dangerous thing to do. Um, and yes, that, that's sad, but it's not as sad as, as the deaths that would be caused uh, if people did sing. Now, here's some uh, measures for people who are already sick, if you have a temperature, a cough, perhaps gastrointestinal symptoms, you know the varied presentation of acute COVID. If somebody is sick, they should wear a mask in the home. They should stay home except to get medical care. Uh, they should isolate from other family members. In other words, they have to spend time in their bedroom rather than in the living room, especially if that person has an elderly relative or a vulnerable relative uh, who, who would uh, perhaps do badly if they developed COVID themselves. Uh, they should tell their close contacts, get tested. Uh, I've, I've tested positive or I, I think I might have COVID, go and get a test. Um, do not share household items, that, that's pretty obvious. Uh, monitor symptoms. Uh, because, of course, it, it's in the second week of, of COVID, as Matt Inada Kim is going to go on to tell you, uh, that people might deteriorate, so monitor symptoms is important. Uh, and the last thing, uh, sneeze into a tissue. So those are the kind of measures that we need to get across to people if they are sick. And remember, many people with COVID are not very sick. They, they, may, you know, they may only have minor symptoms, but they can be highly contagious. And so it, it's really important to get across the message that you must quarantine at home uh, if, you, if you're exposed, but particularly if you've got any level of symptoms. Now, there's a lot of new research about what kind of mask is effective. Now, a year ago, I was telling people any mask is okay because it stops the droplets coming out of your mouth. And that's true, it does stop droplets. But what we're now uh, realizing is that in order to stop aerosols, we have to really make sure that any air that comes out of the mouth and the nose um, is blocked by the mask. It can't go around the sides. Uh, so the fit of the mask is very, very important. And there's been some interesting tests, um, experiments in particularly in America on the, um, the escape of air around the sides of a mask. And you can see on the left hand side, these two pictures um, that one way of really, one way really effective way of masking is to put on a medical mask and then a, a cloth mask over the top of it. So it's called double masking uh, because the medical mask is a good filter, but it often has gaps around the sides. Uh, but the cloth mask can go over that and make it fit uh, more closely. Another way of doing that is instead of putting a cloth mask over the top, to tie a knot in the side. And I'm going to show you another slide with a better view of that uh, in the next slide. Uh, you can buy what's called a mask fitter, which is basically a kind of three-dimensional rubber band to go over it. 
Uh, and the other thing you can do um, is uh, put some nylon over the mask. Uh, in other words, a pair of ladies, uh, what we in the UK call tights and the Americans call pantyhose. I have no idea what you call them in Tanzania, but you cut up an old pair uh, of women's tights and put those over the mask and that will keep it snug over the face. So lots of different ways there. Um, here's a picture of how to uh, fit the mask closely. You can see the side gap there on the left. Uh, you can see the, uh, the cloth mask over the top of the medical mask. And then on the right hand side, the way of knotting the medical mask uh, right close to the side of the mask and then hooking the ear loops over. Now, I want to talk you through the COVID risk chart. Uh, this is a chart that, that I made uh, for a paper that we published in the British Medical Journal um, more than a year ago now of the risk of SARS-CoV-2 transmission in different settings. Uh, and it's a little bit schematic. We have now uh, quantified the uh, colors. The, the, the colors are really just an estimate of the risk. So green is low risk. Uh, yellow is medium risk and red is high risk, but we, we've now produced quantified estimates of those uh, and we're about to produce, a, we're about to publish a new paper, but this is, this is good enough. This is it's a pretty good estimate. We didn't get it badly wrong. So the top row uh, is people who are wearing masks or face coverings and they're only in contact for a very short time. And on the left, is low occupancy where there's not many people in the room and on the right is high occupancy. And you can see that with low occupancy, if people are wearing face coverings, not there for a long time, you're okay really. Um, the only risk is really when they're vocalizing quite, quite loudly, shouting or singing and they're crowded and in a poorly ventilated indoor space. But otherwise, if you're wearing a mask, you're not in there for very long, say you're popping into the shop. Uh, if your mask is fitting you, that's pretty good. You can see the next row uh, is the same pattern, but the contact is more prolonged. Uh, and you can see that, that uh, particularly poorly ventilated spaces are much higher risk simply because you're there for longer. And then the next row is where people are not wearing masks and the risk increases quite substantially even when there is low occupancy, even when it's not so crowded. And finally, um, at, at the bottom, the last row is no face coverings and contact for a prolonged time. Uh, and really, if, if you're doing that, if you're going into a room for a long time and it's crowded uh, and someone is in there uh, who is contagious for COVID, uh, you may very well catch it. So that's a, a rough, risk charts, uh, which we found very useful. It's been translated into more than 50 languages. Um, if you put the hashtag COVID risk chart into Google, you, you'll be able to download these. Uh, and um, the British Medical Journal is very happy for people to print them off and put them up if, they, if they're helpful. If you'd like to translate it into a new language, uh, get in touch with me. As you can see, we've got Swahili. Uh, already, but I know there's lots of local languages, so I can I can give you the word document of that. Now I want to talk a little bit about improving ventilation in buildings because ventilation is absolutely key. Uh, and interestingly, when I was looking for posters and and videos and things in Swahili, when I, I just thought what's what's already available in in uh, one of the main languages of Tanzania. Actually, there's very little about ventilation. There's a lot about hand washing. There's a lot about masks and, and physical distancing, uh, but I couldn't find much about ventilation. Uh, and yet ventilation is crucial. So there's a, there's a job for someone to make some posters about ventilation. Um, so I'm gonna just send you, I'm gonna show you now uh, Rebecca Inglis's uh, pictures which she made for Laos, actually, a different country, but I think uh, it's similar kind of um, income levels, similar climate, I, I think. So I don't think the pictures are going to be uh, very inappropriate. I, I, um, for example, here, the safest way to minimize the transmission is by being outside. You can see here uh, the top of a tent, but the sides of the tent uh, don't exist. You know, it's just it's just a roof. 
so that is a great uh, setting, much better than being indoors, because if you're indoors, the levels of the virus build up. Uh, if you are indoors, monitor the carbon dioxide levels. Uh, you can get a machine relatively cheaply and you don't need one for every room. They're very small, they're very portable and you can carry them from room to room. So you only really need one per business or one per hospital or something like that. Now the outdoor level of uh, carbon dioxide is about 400 parts per, per million. Inside, ideally 400 to 600. Um, it's okay if it's 600 to 800, but once you get above 800, what that indicates is there's a lot of exhaled air in that room. People are breathing out and it's not, uh, it's not dissipating into the air. Um, it's unsafe to go above 1300. Uh, and if you, if you look on Twitter, I don't know whether you're Twitter followers, people will sometimes show pictures of CO2 monitor levels in uh, stuffy win in stuffy rooms with the windows closed and it'll be going up over 2,000 2, and that is very very problematic. Um, okay so open the windows, keep the windows open and where possible and this is beautifully illustrated in, in this room, open windows on two sides of a room so that you get a through draft uh, because it's it's the air passing through uh, that's important. Uh, we've all seen hospital waiting rooms like this. The more people that are in the room, the higher the risk, especially sometimes people sit for hours waiting to see the doctor or the nurse. Get them to wait outside if possible. Uh, and I had to do this myself the other day. I went to the dentist and I stood outside for 20 minutes uh, and I wasn't the only one. People were very annoyed. Why can't we go indoors and sit down? The answer is because they're controlling the risk. Um, set your extractor fans to blow outwards. That is what they were designed to do, um, but many of them have been fitted incorrectly. So make sure they haven't been. Check the direction by holding a piece of tissue up to the blower. Unblock the air vents. Um, I mean, people talk about these fancy filters and things that you can buy, very expensive filters, but perhaps the, the first thing you can do is go and check the air vents and take off the sticky tape that someone put on there to stop the draft. We, we need drafts. Use your fans carefully. Um, it's no good, really, if, there's no, if the windows are not open. You need to open the windows um, because otherwise the, the fan is just blowing contaminated air around. Make sure the fan is blowing from a clean area to a less clean area. So in this, the nurse's station blowing towards the patient area rather than the other way around on the assumption that the patients are more likely to have COVID than the nurses. Let's, let's hope that's the case. Um, also important to make sure the fans are positioned so they don't blow the infected air from one person to another. Um, there's been a number of studies in restaurants where the, the air conditioning or the fans have blown the infected air from one person across to others. So uh, use your imagination with these fans. Be careful with air conditioning. It feels lovely, doesn't it? It feels really clean because it's cool. Um, but if they are simply recycling air, um, then it's a false, it's an illusion that this air is clean. It's, it's not clean. Um, now, what they say here is that if you've got a, a single room with a patient in, the patient is sick, they've got a fever, it, it's, it's humane, it's, it's kind to, to cool that room, uh, make the patient comfortable. But then what you need to do is when the staff go in, you've got to open the window and let that air out uh, and get some fresh air in uh, rather than build up uh, because otherwise that patient's going to infect other patients and staff. Um, here's a, a, a nice kind of vehicle for transporting patients. I don't know if you have these in Tanzania, but you know, it hasn't got any windows or doors. Uh, that's much better than, than one of those modern looking ones with, uh, with the, uh, you know, the closed sides. Now, staff rooms are really dangerous for um, <coughs> doctors, nurses catching COVID from each other. 
um, you health professionals are at high risk of developing COVID and passing it on to one another. And the place where you're most likely to share it is in those lovely rooms where you go for your rest and your food and, and talking to each other. So you need to avoid overcrowding, preferably grab your lunch, put it on a plate and take it outside to eat it rather than stay indoors in the staff room. Um, optimize your mechanical ventilation. Uh, I've no idea uh, what, what things are like in, in your hospital buildings, but some hospitals have these inbuilt mechanical ventilation systems uh, because they're pumping fresh air into the building. So that's a good thing, uh, but make sure they're properly serviced and that they've been set up uh, appropriately. Finally, um, I've, I've learned a new term in, 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 my, in my new expertise of, uh, on airborne infection, which is HEPA. It stands for High Efficiency Particulate Air, and it can filter up to 99% of this virus from room air. So these are much more efficient than the standard, what they call MERV filters, but these filters again have got to be put in properly. They've got to be sealed in place. Uh, they've got to be replaced frequently because otherwise uh, they don't work. And so you assume it's filtering the air, but it's not really. So that's all I've got to say for now. I will be available um, both live and also uh, on Twitter for a while afterwards to answer your questions. Uh, I'm sure I've, I've forgotten all sorts of things, but you'll tell me what those are and I'll try and answer them. So thank you again, and I will hand back to the chair and stop sharing my screen.